Welcome to another episode of Crime Pays Botany Doesn't. We're here at the only remaining population of one of Florida's most endangered plants. And this is it right here. This entire, just these like seven or eight little plants. It's it's kind of bleak. But uh, supposedly there's more in cultivation. This is the last remaining wild population after the rest got turned into orange groves and subdivisions and bleak uh, McMansions like those that are behind me right now. But uh, regardless, anyway, this is Cyrilla arida, the sand tie tie, or as I like to call it, the sand titty, which is a uh, basically a drought tolerant relative of the non-drought tolerant Cyrilla racemiflora, also known as the swamp titty, which is very common in wetlands in the southeast. The order is the blueberry order, Ericales, and the family Cyrillaceae. I think there's like 15 species uh, in, uh, in Cyrillaceae. I'm not sure if they're all New World or what, but you could see this last remaining population is growing here up against the telephone pole, uh, totally at risk of development and destruction, um, but you could see it is producing uh, abundant Abundant fruits. These uh, these little yellow ovaries are uh, maturing right here. But this is remarkable, and it's remarkable to me because I know Cyrilla racemiflora. It's by no means an uncommon plant. But what's remarkable about this is now here in this like mini desert environment of Central Florida, which is just basically deep sand. I mean, very fast draining deep sand. This region gets upwards of 60 inches of rain a year. Um, but this sand is very, very fast draining, and you uh, d during the winter, it's also it's the dry season, so it doesn't rain for sometimes months. All right, I mean, look, there's fucking cactus growing here for Christ's sake. There's a Punthia uh, strana. That thing will bite too. It makes me want to wear snake gators when I'm walking past it. So you take a you take a, a wet loving plant, and you uh, put the population of that wet loving plant in proximity to a uh, very uh, drier, a much drier habitat and you're eventually going to get a more drought tolerant uh, phenotype that uh, ends up turning into a more drought tolerant species you know given enough generations and however many millions of years you end up with this cyrilla arida really remarkable this is a really fucking cool plant to see let's take a look at the flowers so there's those flowers and they're uh, supposedly pollinated by helictid bees by sweat bees you know those little cool metallic bastards little small uh, metallic uh, sweat bees and uh, you can see they got when we look closer, they got the five petals and they got the stamens alternating with the petals and you got that white ovary in the center there. This is, there's only one or two uh, racemes still in flower. Most have already gone to fruit, but you can see what's going on with the leaves here. The leaves are drastically reduced, only an inch or two long, uh, very glabrous. They're reducing their surface area so they don't transpire as much moisture through those stomata. And you got a whole, t a whole suite of other sand loving plants here, sand endemic plants, plants that you'll only find growing on sand because the evolutionary traits or rather the suite of evolutionary traits that enable one to tolerate growing in sand make it hard to grow in other places like a swamp where you just become you know very prone to rot so a lot of these plants uh, have very deep tap roots the grasses have fibrous roots they can have deep fibrous roots but all the eudicots you know the cotyledon the uh, dicot plants have uh, have deeper deeper roots and often storage roots as well there's a whole shit ton of cool uh lichens on the ground like you get here this puffy bastard is a cladonia subtenuous god knows how old it is probably very old you also get the uh, cladonia uh, evansii and cladonia prostrata those little white crusts over there i mean and this is what most of the area was before it got turned into orange groves and strip malls and subdivisions i mean it's such a unique and cool habitat that all right there is geobalanus oblongifolius from the family chrysobalanaceae order malpighiales the order of uh, rubber and euphorbia and this cool legume that almost looks like a rose that's chapmania floridana which has flowers that uh, close up by 11 a.m they open up around 6 a.m close up by 11 a.m talk about a probably a specialist pollination system also very deep roots and o you'll only find this on sand and because the humidity is so high, we have Tillandsia recurvata as well, aka ball moss, which drinks through its leaves. You got all those uh, peltate like scale like trichomes on those long leaves, which uh, help it absorb water. But this is uh, how many how many individuals we got? Like I'm literally there's like seven or eight. We've got Smilax auriculata as well, as you can see right there. And the genus Polygonella in the buckwheat family Polygonaceae is common as hell on sand too. I've seen like six species in the last few days. This is Polygonella mariophylla. You can see those tiny white flowers. 
Ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful tiny white flowers, and some of them smell really good. Also over there, there's a Polygonella robusta, uh, which you could see forming those little clumps. Which also you could also you could see the white flowers from here. Holy shit! Yeah, that thing smells incredible. Got a invasive periwinkle as well. There's the white phenotype, and then we've got the Melanus repens, nettle grass, which is a real pain in the ass, real horrible invasive. More that Opuntia austrina. And of course, Selaginella arenicola, which is a lycophyte, a sand loving lycophyte. It's a resurrection plant that can, you know, basically dry up to a crust and then you get, get it a little bit wet. It comes back to life within 30 minutes, starts photosynthesizing and metabolizing again, and, you know, goes on its merry way until it dries out again and then goes dormant. Here's that colony of Geobalanus. Yeah, this is all Cladonia prostrata, that cool lichen. That cool, it's just a fungus and an algae living together. The fungus farming the algae. Then we got a relative of the plant that's in California known as woolly blue crows. This is Trichostoma. This is Trichostoma brigizii or zellii. They get those stamens flexing back like that. And that, that big purple juicy uh, labia petal. Mint family lamiaceae. Ooh, you can smell it too from those leaves. And then turning around and stepping onto the nearly blinding sugar sand, let's take a look at this Polygonella robusta, because I love this plant. Oh, yeah, look at that big stunner. Look at that. Oh, look, the flowers up top are wide open. The flowers down below are... They're being a little fucking shy right now. That's okay, though. Look, and then it gets those, those almost linear leaves. Have not seen a lot of hairy plants here. I mean, there might be some pubescence, but unlike the Texas sand sheet, they're not as hairy, probably because it's so humid. I'm sure the humidity selects against the uh, hairiness but meanwhile the the sand is selecting for hairiness because it can uh, it, it's so fast draining and you know you want to conserve moisture but i guess again if you get 60 inches of rainfall in a place you don't need to worry about conserving moisture so much so stepping over here now we're uh on the edge of the scrub remember all this this scrub is fire dependent too and this has obviously been fire suppressed for a few decades uh, but most of these plants come right back from fire. You got Sable Atonia, you have, uh, you got the Serenoa Repens, you got the pines which are fire dependent, the oaks always come back from fire as well. We got Quercus Enopina right here which is a scrub oak and it's uh, the best way to tell this plant is those highly folded leaves. Other scrub oak species like this one that's right next to it, Quercus Geminata, will have folded leaves as well but these are narrower and they're not they're not as broad and as folded as this quercus enopina is extremely cool and also quercus enopina doesn't have much fuzz on the underside whereas quercus geminata does and quercus geminata is common as hell but it is man it is one of my favorite oak species my new favorite oak species let's look at that and see if you could see the uh, the denser pubescence on her oh yeah there you go look at that right the undersides of the leaves are where all the stomata are where all the CO2 is taken in and the water vapor let out, so that's why uh, most of the hairs are under there. But you still got those glabrous tops to uh, shed water easily and prevent rot. And then going down here, we got just a host of four different species of Cladonia, uh, as well as the Polygonella. Cladonia subtenuous here, and then the white one is a Cladonia avanzii, and then down here, where we get Cladonia prostrata too? Just a little, it looks like little chips, right? And I guess supposedly stepping on it might benefit a little bit, at least so I've heard. You know, you break it up, it's like uh, breaking up the mycelium, letting it spread. And then this bastard, this diminutive bastard, which is not looking so robust right here, but definitely can get more robust uh, in other conditions. This is a member of a family you don't often get in North America. This is the Rock Rose family Cystaceae, which is in the order of Malvales. And supposedly these are ectomycorrhizal herbs. That is, they associate with ectomycorrhizal fungus, which to me is just fucking wild. Most of the members of this family... Uh, occur in the Mediterranean region of Europe, but you can see this thing is obviously built for uh, wind, uh, drought, and hot. You can see it's got pubescence on them leaves, and uh, love to see some in flower, but apparently they're not flowering now. Crocanthemum nashii is this species, and you also get uh, the genus Lechia as well, but I don't see any right here. Ah, oh, look at that spread. Look at that sand spread. Selaginella arenicola, and then a whole host of different lichen species. God damn it. And then right there, we just got Sable Atonia. You know, we got this non-native bromeliad, you know? Not as bad as it could be, though. You know, it's, it's from the Neotropics, so... Might have been here 50 million years ago. Is this one of the invasive lantanas? Oh, that habitat needs to burn, though. See, look how big Quercus Geminata can get. 
and the leaves get bigger once it gets bigger too. But again, I've all adapted the burning. You know, this landscape evolved with fire. When you're here in the dry season, it'll still be 90 fucking degrees, but it hasn't rained in a few months, and so you can see how easy it would be for most of this to go up. So it's actually kind of shit for brain to suppress fire here, because then you just get fuels building up, and you get a, you're going to get a massive conflagra conflagration when you eventually do get a fire, because you're not going to be able to keep fire away. Look, at you got that Tillandsia and everything as well. Look at that Tillandsia, just draping. But yeah, none of this is protected, you know? You could come back in two years and there'll be a Dollar General here, you know? Or some other, you know, heinous commercial shit. That's the story of Florida. That's becoming the story of much of Texas, too. You just let these greedy, money-grubbing shitbag developers, and they're, they're, all, they're all, you know, just fucking entangled in the politics, too. So you can't do anything about it. <laughs> you can't do anything about it. There's no checks and balances, right? It always kind of works like that. The people that aspire to that shit always tend to be the sociopaths and nut jobs and the... God, I love this Paranikia. I love that fucking Paranikia too. How about that? Yeah, that Paranikia, man. Karyophyllaceae, the Carnation family, and the white sugar sand, just the ground down remnants of the Appalachian Mountains. Washed out to sea and then washed back up. But such remarkable habitat, you know? How do you get, what was I ranting about? What was I, what was I ranting about? That the fucking sickos and sociopaths, you call that degenerate, degenerate behavior. That money-grubbing, degenerate behavior. You know, you sick fucks. Get some values. Get a hobby. Find something that drives you besides accumulating bullshit you don't need. Eh? It's one thing to want to be comfortable. It's another thing to just want to hoard. Right? You think you think natural selection would have filtered that shit out. But, you know, I guess not. It might be our undoing. God, I love this. I love this. Oh, look at the Opuntia. And you got a little Comalina erecta there, too. Ooh, is it erect? How erect is it? Fucking Opuntia. Ooh! Is that Quercus Chapmanii or who's this? We got Lyonia right here too. What is that? Ferruginia, Fruticosa. I fucking haven't learned the uh, differences between them. But Ericaceae. And all you gotta know is that Lyonia, of course, has the uh, the woody capsules. And what Quercus is this? Is this Quercus Chapmanii? And it's in, look, you got acorns on it too. I'm have to get money shots of that. Not much pubescence on that underside. Yeah, the humidity, I would assume, really selects against. The intense humidity and high rainfall really selects against the hairs here, right? Oh, we got Liatris olingere, another sand endemic. Fucking wild Liatris. Look at the flower head on that. It only produces, you'll never see a plant with more than a few flower heads on it, right? Unlike most Liatris, which have spikes of, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of flowers. But, uh, but when this thing go, is going off, god damn, it's impressive as hell. Doesn't need any ray petals. Doesn't need any any of those uh, those da daisy petals, which are you, you know just the uh, the ligules, because it's such a showy. The, the individual florets are so big. Probably got a massive root down there too. Fucking love this species, man. Wild, wild stuff. Oh, and Zymenia americana, of course, the hog plum, which is edible. And one of the only members of the family Olacaceae, which is a hemiparasitic family in the order of mistletoes, Santalales. It's one of the only members that you get uh, in the United States, in North America. Most members of that family uh, occur in Australia and uh, South Africa. Look at that stuff. Yeah, man, you need a burn. You need a burn at some point. But look at how graceful the Tillandsia usneoides looks. Such, I've been wanting to come to this habitat for so long. Such an endangered ecosystem. I don't know how. It's so incredible. You'd think they want to preserve a little bit more of it than they have. But fucking A. Is that Lyonia lucida? I believe it is. There we go. There's Zymenia americana. You can see it's got the thorns on it. And it's also got those distinctive yellow fruits, which are actually edible and slightly delicious. Ola Casey. A hemiparasite. Oh, it's Sideroxylon tenax in fruit. Ooh. Ah, it's not bad. It's pretty good. Doing fruit diagnosis. Again, look at those. Look at the calyces. Look at the remaining sepals on top of the fruit. That'll help you identify what it is. Oh, that's nice. It's a nice photo right there. Anyway, such a cool, such a cool phenomenon to study. Another drought tolerant version of a more moisture-loving species. I mean, beyond that, a, a swamp-loving species. 
The sand titty, everybody. All right, that's all I got. Have a good rest of your day. Hopefully this won't be a Dollar General if I ever come back here. Go fuck yourself, bye.